This lecture, I think, is one of the gems of the class. We developed an algorithm recently to generate what we call spatially variant lattices, and we're doing all kinds of things with it. So all in this lecture, we're going to describe this algorithm and also give you a little bit of an idea of what we're doing with it. So after the introduction, uh, I've divided this presentation really into two major sections, or at least how I'm presenting the algorithm. The first thing is just one-dimensional ruled gradings, a single grading vector, and we want to learn how to spatially vary that. And it turns out 90% of what we need to know is in that section of information. The next thing, we will generalize that to arbitrary lattices that can be cross gradings, three dimensional, meta materials, whatever. And what we'll see, it's just a simple generalization to what we learned with 1D gradings. We will Fourier transform a unit cell into a set of 1D gradings, spatial harmonics if you will. We spatially vary each of those individually and add up the answers. I also want to talk briefly about how I think this can be hybridized with transformation electromagnetics, which we talked about just a couple lectures ago. And then at the very end, I'll show you what we're doing in our group to apply the spatially variant algorithm. The first thing I want to mention, and if we're looking at the block on the left, it's smooth, homogeneous, nothing interesting there. I would argue we can't control electromagnetic fields with homogeneous materials. We have to have some kind of interface or two different types of materials, a curved surface, a gradient, some kind of inhomogeneity in order to control the field. So why is it almost all photonic crystals and metamaterials that people are studying in literature, why are they at least macroscopically homogeneous? Imagine the power and the, and the performance that we have just locked away in these things if we could figure out how to make them inhomogeneous. Now there's a problem with that, particularly with photonic crystals. They derive their properties from an interaction between adjacent unit cells that have to look the same. If we make it inhomogeneous, suddenly adjacent unit cells don't look so much the same and maybe that could stop working. And that's a problem that this algorithm addresses. This slide essentially types in text what we said on the previous slide. But what I want to add is, what is it that we spatially vary about a periodic structure? One, and one of the big ones that we're playing with is the orientation of the unit cells. Every property of photonic crystals or metamaterials, any of those properties I can think of, has some kind of directionality or directional dependence. Maybe they they change depending what direction the electric field is oscillating or what direction the wave is going. There's some kind of directional dependence. We cannot exploit that at all if we have no way of changing the orientation of the unit cells as a function of position. So orientation of the unit cells is a big one. Lattice spacing is another. Fill fraction. Material composition. The pattern. The symmetry. And maybe there's other things. And maybe we want to spatially vary each of those, in other words, make each of those a function of position, and they're, they're spatially varied completely independently of each other. That's pretty neat, and we can do that with this algorithm. First, I want to mention just some terminology, so we're starting at a common point. There is what's called the unit cell. And when we do electromagnetic modeling on the unit cell, in fact, we're not really modeling a unit cell, we're modeling an infinitely periodic lattice. And that is what we would call the uniform lattice. So we have a unit cell and a uniform lattice. When we're modeling the unit cell, that really implies we're modeling a big uniform lattice. What we'd like to do is make this uniform lattice not uniform, but in a way that preserves the properties of it being a uniform lattice. And that, that'll make more sense hopefully in a few slides. Okay, so what is a spatially variant lattice? Here's a cartoon of a photonic crystal or a meta material. It's a checkerboard and it does something wonderful and let's say it does something wonderful in the horizontal direction. 
Now what I want to do is grab it at either side, the left and right, and I want to bend this lattice like an accordion. What on earth would that look like? Well, if we just did it conventionally or with a coordinate transformation, here's what it could look like. Now, we've just designed this initial lattice to do something wonderful. And our unit cells need to look like squares or this won't work. When we bent it here, notice how compressed and, and stretched and deformed the unit cells look. So they're really small here, they're really stretched out here. So different parts of the lattice will be working at different frequencies. And it seems like this is the only way to do this. But we want to be able to bend the lattice without deforming the unit cells, or at least minimizing that. So using our algorithm, what would this lattice look like bent 90 degrees while attempting to preserve the size and shape of the squares? Well, here's what it looks like from our lattice. And the blue line is to guide your eyes to show you that the lattice really has been bent 90 degrees, yet the size and shape of the unit cells are almost constant. Notice it's not perfect, but so I would word this that the deformations are minimized. And in fact, we're, we're working on some more algorithms or more advanced algorithms that can do even better. But a few other key features here. The lattice is perfectly smooth and continuous. There are no defects. In other words, there's no abrupt change in the lattice. And that's really important because that can cause scattering and diffraction. And then the second really important thing, we minimize the deformations. We've just designed this thing to work wonderfully with the unit cells being squares. So we still need them to be squares, which we've done really well in this lattice. So let's summarize really the capabilities of this algorithm. Now I'm only showing three properties here, but we can make a map of how we want the unit cells to be oriented. So we're, we're doing it in some kind of arcing pattern. And if we were to generate a spatially variant lattice, we see that our lattice is in an arcing pattern. But notice the spacing from unit cell to unit cell is very consistent. The size and shape of the triangles is consistent. The only thing we've done is arc the orientation of the unit cells. Well, maybe we didn't want to do that. Maybe we wanted to somehow bloat the lattice spacing in the middle of the lattice. And we do that. And we've bloated the lattice spacing here. But otherwise, the, the, the orientation of the triangles is the same. The fill fraction is the same. Uh, pretty amazing that we can do that. Maybe we want to adjust the fill fraction from left to right. Go from small triangles to big triangles. Lattice spacing is the same. The orientation is the same. Yet we spatially vary the fill fraction. This one's done a lot in the literature. The other two are less common and uh, rarely, rarely see the first one. But what's really neat, we can do all three at the same time and independently. I've chosen these to be completely different functions for spatial variance to show that we can do all three at the same time. And the resulting lattice is smooth, continuous, defect-free, and we're minimizing the deformations that we do not want. Pretty neat algorithm. There are other approaches to generating spatially variant lattices. One thing we can do is take a bunch of uniform lattices and chop them apart and reorient them and put them together. I would call this a segmented approach. The problem with this are these discontinuities. We get scattering and diffraction where the lattices are discontinuous. and That's not something that we want if we can avoid it. We also see things like the cloak developed by Duke University. Really that is uniform in cylindrical coordinates. But Manufacturing wise, we make this as flat and then bend it, and then we would have a spatially variant lattice. There's coordinate transforms, and we can envision making a flat, uniform lattice and then bending it. And that gives us a spatially variant lattice of sorts. Or we can truly spatially vary everything, like what we're doing in this lecture. So what are some benefits and drawbacks of what we just saw? Well, flat lattices. This is really easy to do. We make a flat periodic lattice and then we bend it. Very easy to do. However, most photonic crystals and metamaterials, once you deform it, it no longer works. 
So really, we would like to deform it without deforming it, almost do the impossible, like uh, the bending of the, the checkerboard, bending that like an accordion. We sort of did the impossible there. So that's very difficult, to take something that's just designed regularly and just bend it, uh, because usually the unit cells are not designed to be bent. Uh, we can take the uniform lattices with discontinuities, also easy to generate, but we have the scattering problem that we talked about on the last slide. Then there's coordinate transformation. That gives us true spatial variance. We can retrieve exact dimensions from that. It is very fast, particularly when we do it analytically. The one problem with coordinate transformation is that we're limited in the complexity of the, spatially, of the spatial variance, particularly if we're doing it analytically. Now, the approach I'm going to show you here, we can get true spatial variance. We can spatially vary any lattice parameter, even things that coordinate transformation can't do. Some drawbacks, though, what I'm going to show you is slower and I think less scalable than other methods. So as we go to larger devices, this method does become, I think, a bit more difficult than something like coordinate transformation. On to our first main subject here. And I would say 90% of the theory and what you need to know in spatial variance is contained in this next section. And we're focusing on just a one-dimensional grading, a ruled grading, if you will, so just a single grading vector. And we want to make this grading vector now a function of position and see what happens. So just to remind us, what is a grading vector? Well, imagine we have some material property that's varying in amplitude according to a cosine. And we define a vector that's perpendicular to those planes and whose magnitude is 2 pi divided by the spacing between the planes. So given this grading vector big K, we can describe, for example, the, the dielectric constant as some average plus some contrast, the dielectric contrast, times a cosine of k dot r. And this cosine k dot r is really the utility of the grading vector. We can just dot product with position and reconstruct our grading. So hopefully after computational electromagnetics and everything up to this point, you are masters of the grading vector. So given this grading vector, how can we reconstruct gradings and how can we control them? Well, the most obvious thing, let's just construct cosine of k dot r. Well, this is a smooth, continuously varying function and it goes from negative one to positive one. And we can see this smoothly uh, varying function. And obviously our grading vector is, is pointing in this direction, although I haven't shown it. Then we can do the same thing, but we can set a threshold. We can say anywhere that this cosine function is greater than zero, we'll make a one, and everywhere else is zero. Now suddenly we have a binary grading. And in fact, this is often more useful because if we're making things with 3D printing or manufacturing, usually it's much more difficult to make these graded dielectric constant structures, whereas over here, we can either have a material or have a different material. Let's say this is air and then plastic, or air and then silicon. That's very easy to do. Well, in addition to just having a threshold of zero, we can set it to some arbitrary number and now actually control the duty cycle. So here, we generate this anywhere cosine is greater than 0.8 we get the, the white lines anywhere that it's greater. So we have these really, really skinny lines because it actually spends most of its time being less than 0.8. Okay, so now we're masters of constructing gradings with a grading vector. What happens now when this grading vector is a function of position? Remember the two pieces of information that the grading vector carries, the orientation of the grading and also its period. So we can potentially spatially vary those independently. Well, if we, probably the most obvious thing or the first thing we'd want to try is just, well, let's just let this be a function of position and try to construct it with cosine k dot r. It turns out that doesn't work and we'll show you that and I'll explain why. So what do we do? We introduce another parameter that we're going to call the grading phase. That's this phi, which is a function of r. So let's go back to what we know about waves. They propagate according to a wave vector. 
as a wave propagates, we think of the wave as accumulating phase. An alternate way, if somehow we had knowledge of the phase as it propagated through space, we could take that phase and then also reconstruct what that wave looked like, rather than use the wave vector. We're borrowing that here. It's not a wave. Our, our grading certainly is not moving. But we can pretend that there is this phase. And it turns out the phase of the grading, phi, is the gradient of this, I'm sorry, the gradient of the, of the phase is our grading vector. So really, we would start with knowing how we want to spatially vary our grading vector. We have to calculate phi, and we need to solve this differential equation to do that. So how do we do that? And we'll explain that uh, later in a few slides. But once we know phi, somehow we've calculated that from k, now we can construct our function according to cosine of phi. So we replace k dot r with phi. And now we have a proper reconstruction. Let's think more about this grading phase. And the equations on the top here, I'm, I'm relating back to a wave phenomenon. But let, let's draw some pictures here. Well, we start off with our grading vector. But we can also think of this as a wave vector. And we have a wave traveling this way. If we were to track it and look at its phase, we would see the phase accumulate going left to right. And so we can think of that as a phase of wave or our grading phase. Then, if we calculate the cosine of this, we get our grading. So we're sort of pretending that our grading is a wave, even though we know it's not moving, uh, and just calculating what the phase would be if it propagated according to this grading function, pretending that's sort of a wave vector. So we're making an analogy with a wave, and hopefully we have a little bit better intuitive understanding of this grading phase parameter. But think of it this way, if, if we do have a wave traveling from lower left to upper right, certainly it would accumulate phase from the lower left to upper right. Likewise, if our grading vector is pointing in this direction, we could construct a grading phase. And the cosine of this gives us our grading. So what does it mean when we spatially vary k? Well, if we look at the upper left, this is a uniform k. And so the phase would accumulate from left to right. And we would just get a ruled grading going left to right. If we had a uniform k, this is similar to the last slide, from lower left to upper right. We see our grading phase accumulates from lower left to upper right. And we get a grading that goes from lower left to upper right. Well, now, if we spatially vary k, here we're changing the orientation, but not the period, evidently, because the magnitudes of these vectors aren't changing. But we're definitely changing the orientation of the k. k is now a function of position. The grading phase might look something like this. So at the left, we definitely see that the phase is increasing left to right, as the grading vector would prescribe. But then as it approaches the right-hand side of the grid, it starts to diverge up and down. And we can see that in the phase. The phase starts to push down and up. And if we calculate the cosine of this, we get our grading. However, if we would just calculate a cosine of this k dot r, it would not look like this, and things would get pretty squirrely and we'll spend the next couple slides talking about that. So this is a spatially variant 1D grading. Okay, so now we have another crazy spatially variant K field. And if we do a direct reconstruction, so in other words, we're taking cosine of K dot R, this looks completely crazy. However, if we go through the grading phase, and notice our, our grading vectors going left to right initially, then kind of pushes down and then left to right. So we can see that in the phase. It's pushing left to right, then down, and left to right again. And we can see that in the reconstructed grading. This one, we've taken the cosine of the grading phase. And we can see this working a lot better. So what's going on? Why is this? So here's a simple example to illustrate what's happening. Let's say we want to create a chirped grading, something that starts with a short period and goes to a long period. 
So we could describe the period as a function of z, some lambda naught constant times z. So when z is small, the overall period is small, and as z gets bigger, the overall period gets bigger. Well, we can describe this period as a spatially variant k function. Remember k, the magnitude of this k anyway, is 2 pi over the period. Now the period is a function of z, so our grading vector is a function of z, and it's 2 pi over lambda naught z. Now let's think what happens when we do a direct reconstruction. So our dielectric constant as a function of z would be cosine of k dot r, but if for a one-dimensional problem that just ends up being our, our k as a function of z times z. So we plug in our k as a function of z times z, but notice the z's cancel now. And we're left with just cosine of 2 pi over lambda naught. That's a constant. So we did all of our math correctly, but we don't reconstruct the chirp grading at all. In fact, we just got a constant number. Well, that's horrible. So what's the answer? What do we do? Now let's go through the grading phase. So in our first equation, we have the gradient of the phase equals our spatially variant k function. Well, this is a one-dimensional grading, so it's only a function of z. So the gradient just becomes the derivative of phi in the z direction equals 2 pi over lambda naught z. This is k as a function of z. Now we solve this differential equation for phi by integrating. So phi is the integral from minus infinity up to z. We're integrating our k as a function of z. And we work through the math. And, and here's our answer. So we solve this differential equation for phi. And this really shouldn't be any surprise. Now let's construct our grading from the grading phase. So our dielectric constant as a function of z is now cosine of the function we found by solving our differential equation. And lo and behold, we get our chirped grading. So the big conclusion here, when we have a spatially variant grading vector, we cannot reconstruct the grading by saying cosine of k dot r. We have to go through the grading phase in order to do that. So the question comes back, well, how do we solve that differential equation? And that's actually not too easy, but we can solve it using finite differences. That's not the only way. We can use pretty much any numerical technique, but if you've taken the computational electromagnetics course, you're, you're pretty strong in finite differences, and it works very well here. So let's start with our governing equation. This is what we want to solve for phi. We can expand this equation, write it in sort of a block matrix form. Our gradient operator it's just a column vector of our three derivatives. So we're taking the gradient of phi and getting our three components of the grading vector. And these can be functions of position. OK, now we take this equation and we replace our derivatives with uh, matrices. So this is a square matrix that would take the derivative of phi in the x direction. So phi will be a column vector of our grading phase. So if we started off with that, and we took the derivative in the x direction of phi, we would get kx. So kx, little kx, that's the column vector of the x component of our grading vector, which is a function of position. Right now, this is the known quantity. We're trying to find this. So we've converted our governing equation over to matrix form. Now, boundary conditions. This is where, in the beginning of the class, we discussed Newman boundary conditions. Our spatial variance isn't necessarily periodic, although maybe it could be. But usually our, spatially, our spatial variance just continues and kind of goes off of the grid and, and goes off forever. And we need some kind of boundary condition that lets it do that. One option is the Newman, and that's what we've implemented here. But that's not the only option. And I would also propose that perhaps better boundary conditions exist for doing this. Now here's a problem. Let's take our matrix equation and write it as three separate equations. We have one thing that we're trying to calculate from three different things. So we have three things that are known trying to calculate one unknown. Let's turn this around and think of it this way. We have one thing and we're trying to control three things. So through this one function grading phase, we're trying to, to arbitrarily control 
three other things. We don't have enough degrees of freedom to do that. So our matrix equation really would look like this if we were to plot this somehow. Our gradient matrix over here would have some width, but be very, very tall. We would have a column vector phi and then a giant column vector containing the three components of K. So it looks like this. And we have fewer unknowns than we have knowns. And so we can't do this. We can't find any value of that phi or the grading phase that will satisfy all the kx, ky, kz requirements. So what do we do? Well, we end up doing a best fit. And this is where, when I say it minimizes de deformations but does not eliminate them, it can only minimize them because it's, it's a best fit. We're trying to control three things with only one, and we can't do that. But this also has implications on how we solve it. So we're going to solve this in the sense of least squares. So what we have up to this point is an AX equals B problem. However, there's uh, the B is much larger than X. So we have this problem. So for least squares, to skip a lot of fear, it reduces down to this. We'll take the transpose of A and pre-multiply both sides of this equation. So here's our big A matrix. We transpose it, it flops over on its side. We'll pre-multiply both sides. So what happens when you multiply these two matrices together? We end up with a greatly reduced matrix equation, but this has the same number of knowns as unknowns. So this little tiny square matrix is A prime, that's just A transpose A, so A prime, and that's this. We have our grading phase, that's untouched. On the other side, we have a B prime. It's a reduced set of knowns, and that's A transpose times B. So we simply solve this new equation now, A prime times X equals B prime. And so we solve this for X, which in this case is our grading phase. So that's solving the grading phase in the sense of least squares. The big thing to come away with, it's a best fit. We can't choose, probably can't choose a value of phi that can satisfy all three components of the grading vector as we've defined them. We sure would like to, but we probably can't do that. So here's the algorithm summary for spatially varying a 1D grading. The first thing we want to do is describe the spatial variance. And so we come up with, at first, two maps. What do we want the period to look like at every point? And what's the orientation or the angle at every point? Given these two pieces of information, notice those are the two pieces of information that describe our grading vector, we construct our spatially variant K field, if you will. Our K is a function of position. And the reality is we calculate an X and a Y component. We don't have to it's really not one array, it has an X and a Y component. So if we take these two pieces of information and combine them together, this is what we get, the X component and the Y component. If we were doing a three-dimensional problem, there would also be a Z component, but this is just a two-dimensional example. But now we know our spatially variant K functions. Well, now we solve the grading phase using the finite difference method, and when we do that, we get a function that looks something like this. Now we can calculate the grading. So without doing any kind of threshold, just saying cosine phi, this is what we get. And I would call that our analog grading. Well, we probably don't want that. We probably want some kind of binary grading. So we set a threshold. And when this varies very close to a sinusoid, we can make a really good guess as to what the threshold needs to be to realize whatever fill fraction we want. The threshold that we'll use is simply cosine of pi times f, where f is the fill fraction we're after. Now, the less this looks like a cosine and maybe starts looking a little bit more binary or misshapen, the less this equation will work. But now, after this section, we should be able to spatially vary any 1D grading, control its period and, and orientation as a function of position, and also control its fill fraction, even as a function of position. This gamma itself can be a function of position, so now we can spatially vary fill fraction as well. 
Our next subject is generalizing what we've just learned in order to spatially vary lattices, more than just a single grading. So I'm going to present the, the generalization to this step by step. The first step is to generate all the input that this algorithm needs. Well, the first thing we need is a description of the unit cell, the size of the lattice, so maybe it's 20 by 20 unit cells, the orientation of the unit cells as a function of position, the lattice spacing as a function of position, remember we might want to bloat these in the middle or do something else, and the fill fraction as a function of position, and maybe there's other things that we want to spatially vary as well, but we'll focus on these for right now. I'll also mention a grayscale unit cell is very important if we want to spatially vary fill fraction. If we have a very binary looking unit cell, when we reconstruct it, it will look binary and the threshold will have much less effect. Whereas if we start off with a grayscale unit cell, then adjusting fill fraction will have a very strong effect. Step two, we have all this input the very first thing we'll do inside our algorithm is Fourier transform our unit cell. So we'll take our unit cell and through an FFT we can actually decompose this into a whole set of 1D gradings if you will. So the FFT gives us the complex amplitudes associated with each one of these 1D gradings. The directions of these just come from this closed form equation. So we actually know the direction and magnitudes of all those, and we've, we've done that before. This should be very familiar to you from the plane wave expansion method, from rigorous coupled wave analysis. But the amplitudes of these come from the FFT. Now if we've calculated all of this stuff correctly, we can take each one of these, multiply it by its complex amplitude, do that for each one, and then add them all up, and we'll get our original unit cell back. And so here's the, here's the equation for doing that. We're, we're taking our grading vector, uh, the subscripts PQ, because we have a, an array of wave uh, grading vectors, if you will. So here's where we're reconstructing our grading. We multiply it by its complex amplitude, and we add all of them up. And if we've done this correctly, we should get our original unit cell. Now, we also know that we need an infinite number of these spatial harmonics to perfectly reconstruct that unit cell. Well, we know we're not going to do that. We truncate our set. Maybe we can put some intelligence in there and Fourier transform, look at a whole bunch of spatial harmonics, and just retain the ones that have the highest amplitudes, the greatest magnitude amplitudes. Or we can, maybe we just retain a square, or who knows what we do, but there's, there, we can put some intelligence behind that. But the point is, we will have this finite set of 1D gradings, such that if we added them up, we would get our unit cell back. Here's where I'm visualizing the truncating of the, of the spatial harmonics. So we start off with a unit cell, and we probably build this on a grid. We calculate an FFT, and we get a set of data that looks like this. Now notice there's something kind of crazy happening in the middle. That's where these, the amplitude terms are greater than zero and significant. So if we only retain, let's say, seven by seven of these spatial harmonics, this is what our amplitudes look like. And we could start arguing already that, you know, maybe these outer ones aren't necessary, as necessary. We can certainly put some intelligence into it. For simplicity, we'll keep the full seven by seven. If you took my computational electromagnetics class, this slide will not be a surprise to you, but it's important to remind ourselves what happens when we truncate this set of spatial harmonics. So on the left, we have our starting unit cell. Now if we only used one by one spatial harmonic, this middle block is what the unit cell would look like, the analog unit cell, and the one on the right is what it would look like threshold. So this would be the binary version of that. With three by three harmonics, our triangle looks like a flat egg looking thing. Five by five, it's starting to take on something that kind of looks like a triangle. And as we go up in harmonics, we, we see at some point we, we get a pretty nice triangle. Maybe that's somewhere around 11 by 11 harmonics, we start getting a, a pretty nice triangle. 
But notice even with the analog lattices how binary this is starting to look. So if we reconstructed a spatially variant grading where our unit cells look like this, and we tried to use that threshold to spatially vary fill fraction, that would not work so well. Whereas if we started with a grayscale unit cell, this would look much more grayscale, and the spatially varying that threshold would have much greater control over a spatially variant fill fraction. But when we truncate the spatial harmonics, we get a blurred, deformed version. And if we started with a binary unit cell, we're not going to get as much control over the, the spatially variant fill fraction. Now certainly this extends to three dimensions, and here's my way of visualizing it. We start off with a unit cell, we Fourier transform it, and we get a three-dimensional set of 1D gratings. Each one will have a complex amplitude that we get from a three-dimensional Fourier transform. But the direction and magnitude of the grading vectors associated with each one of those, we calculate just with these closed form equations. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us after seeing plane wave expansion method and rigorous coupled wave analysis. It's the same equations. So here's the algorithm. We take our unit cell, we Fourier transform it, and now we have a whole huge set of 1D gratings. And so for each one of those, and we're doing this independently, for each spatial harmonic, we construct a spatially variant K function. Then we use the finite difference method or whatever other method we might want to use, but we calculate grading phase on a very low resolution grid. Remember how slowly the phase functions seem to vary? So it turns out we can get away with pretty low grid resolution calculating the grading phase. But the final unit cell probably has much more rapidly varying features and we need a high resolution grid. But let's do our, our numerics on this low resolution grid and just interpolate our answer onto the high resolution grid. Now we can construct our, our spatially variant 1D grading, and then we can add all of those as we're doing this to get the overall lattice. And when we're done, we should have a spatially varied unit cell by adding them all up. Let's think more about this grid strategy. Well, for the unit cell, we know since we're Fourier transforming it, we need this on a really, really high resolution grids. Hundreds of points by hundreds of points. And that's not a surprise to us after discussing Maxwell's equation in Fourier space last semester. When we construct our, our direction field or angle or the orientation of our unit cells, whatever we want to call it, this will be on a low resolution grid. From that, we construct our spatially variant K field. And this is a large grid because it's covering the entire lattice now, which could be 40 by 40 unit cells. But it's on the low resolution grid. And then we calculate our grading phase. And this really is, is a computationally intensive step, which is why we want to be on this low resolution grid. Then we interpolate this to be on a high resolution grid same physical amount of space is being discussed. So if this is describing a 20 by 20 unit cell lattice, this is also describing a 20 by 20 unit cell lattice. But there might be 10 times the number of points here. <coughs> then once we have this grading phase on a high resolution grid, we can construct the 1D grading on a high resolution grid, and then add those up to get the overall spatially variant lattice on a high resolution grid. So there's three grids happening here. The original grid describing the unit cell, that's physically small. It's just one unit cell and extremely high resolution, probably much higher resolution than these down here. Then we go to physically large grid, but with very few cells in it. That's the low resolution grid, because the grading phase is probably a smoothly varying and slowly varying function. Then we go to the high resolution grid where we're building the final lattice. So here's the rule of thumbs for calculating these different grid resolutions. Certainly, on our high resolution grid, we need, if we have, let's say, P harmonics, 
maybe that's 11 harmonics. We need at least 110 points on that grid. And from last semester, um, we saw that should probably be several hundred. So we need several hundred by several hundred points on that high resolution grid at least. And that's the unit cell high resolution grid. Then on our low resolution grid, we need to figure out how many unit cells we have, and then we use at least 10 grid cells per unit cell. So if we have 20 by 20 unit cells, our low resolution grid would be about 200 by 200 points. Then on our high resolution grid, we calculate this a different way. The first thing we need to do is figure out what is the shortest 1D grading. Well, we know in this spatial harmonic map that we've drawn, as we get away from that center cell, we're talking about 1D gradings that start varying more and more rapidly. So we go out to the very highest order spatial harmonic and calculate from it its period. So that will be the shortest period. We take that shortest period and divide it by 10, say, and that tells us the resolution on this fine grid. This step probably has the most confusion of all the steps. And this is where we take one of the spatial harmonics, which is already pointing in some direction, and add to it our spatial variance. So let me step you through this process. And also the way I do this changes depending on how many dimensions I'm using. So for this example, it's a two-dimensional problem. We pick one of the spatial harmonics. We probably have a double loop looping over P and Q. But we take one of those spatial harmonics. And it's a grading vector. Or let's say it's pointing in that direction with that magnitude. The first thing I'll do is take this vector and distribute this across the entire grid. So this would be the entire lattice, but it's a uniform function. So in fact, we could directly reconstruct this and see that 1D grading across the entire lattice. But we probably want to spatial vary this in some way. So here's the angle of how we want to reorient the unit cells. So what we have to do is start with this and add the angles associated with the spatially variant orientation. When we do that, this is what we would get. So for example, if the, the default orientation is up and down, there's no angle to add here. So if we look at the grading vector at, at this same spot, and the grading vector over here, we're looking at the same thing. Now over here, where the, we tilt counterclockwise a little bit, we look at this grading vector, we come over here, and it's the same thing, rotated counterclockwise a little bit. Likewise, here we want to rotate clockwise a little bit. So we look at this grading vector, and we go over here, it's basically the same thing, just rotated clockwise a little bit. So we, just, we take a grading vector, distribute it uniformly across the grid, we add to it the angle of our spatially variant orientation, and we get this intermediate K function which has a spatially variant orientation, but we have not adjusted the magnitude of it yet. So here we are again. Here's our, our now intermediate K function, if you will. But let's say we want to bloat the lattice spacing in the middle. That actually means we need to decrease the amplitude of the Ks in the middle. So here is our final spatially variant K function where we've incorporated information from the orientation, the angle, and we've also adjusted the magnitude in order to bloat or compress the lattice spacing. Now we're ready to calculate the grading phase from this. So that is the next step, calculating the grading phase. Step one, we calculate our, our matrices. We have this um, gradient operator. And again, we're in two dimensions right now, or there would be a DZ down here. And we have our column vector. So these are the x components of our spatially variant k function that we constructed on the previous slide, and then the y component. Then we solve that using least square. So we calculate a new a by pre-multiplying by the transpose of a, and a new b by pre-multiplying by the transpose of a, and we calculate the grading phase from that. Now this is the grading phase still just associated with this pq harmonic. Well. I like to reshape it back to a two-dimensional grid at that point. We still have a column vector, so we reshape it back to our x, y, and then we interpolate it to the higher resolution grid. 
Now we have our grading phase for that specific spatial harmonic on a higher resolution grid. Well, we have a double for loop, and we do this for every single one of the spatial harmonics. In the end, let's say we had five by five spatial harmonics. In the end, we would have spatially varied each one of those gratings across the grid, add to it the same angle, incorporate into it the same lattice bloating or compression, and we do it individually for each spatial harmonic. So this is a set of all the spatial harmonics that have been spatially varied over something like a 10 by 10 lattice. If we add all of these together, we get our final spatially variant lattice. The last step is incorporating a spatially variant fill fraction. Assuming our reconstructed lattice has a rather analog or cosine profile, we can make a pretty good guess as to what the threshold value needs to be. And we would say that that's gamma equals cosine pi times f, where f is the fill fraction. Then we can make the binary grading just by setting the, the threshold. But remember, this fill fraction can be a function of position. We can spatially vary fill fraction. In which case, if our fill fraction is a function of position, our threshold will be a function of position, and we apply it as a function of position. Now we have a spatially variant fill fraction, in addition to a spatially variant orientation and a spatially variant lattice spacing. Here's a summary of the overall algorithm. Step one, we design the baseline unit cell. And if you want to incorporate a spatially variant fill fraction, I recommend using a grayscale unit cell. Step two, we're defining all the inputs here. How do we want to spatially vary orientation of the unit cells? How do we want to spatially vary lattice spacing or fill fraction, material composition, etc., etc.? We make maps of all these different things. When we enter the algorithm, <coughs> the first thing we want to do is Fourier transform the unit cell. When we do that, we've calculated the complex amplitudes of all those 1D gratings. The grading vectors associated with those, we have analytical equations for. Then before we enter our main loop, where we spatially vary each of those spatial harmonics individually, we'll initialize an overall lattice to all zeros. Then we enter our loop. So for a two-dimensional lattice, imagine this being a double loop over P and Q, our spatial harmonics over the X and Y directions. Once inside the loop, we will pull off the grading vector associated with whichever spatial harmonic we're, we're iterating at this point, and we distribute that uniformly across the grid. Then we add to that the angle based on the spatially variant orientation. Then we scale its magnitude based on how we want the lattice spacing either to expand or compress. That gives us our spatially variant K function. At that point, we calculate the grading phase. Remember, that's all done on a low resolution grid. Given the grading phase, we interpolate that to a high resolution grid, which is where we construct the spatially variant 1D grading. So that particular spatial harmonic has now been spatially varied over the entire grid. We add that grading to the overall lattice, which at first is all zeros, but as we do this, we're adding more and more harmonics. And at the end of this, we will see this spatially variant unit cell over the entire lattice. If we had a grayscale unit cell, we'll see that all those unit cells are grayscale, and we can now apply a spatially variant threshold to do a spatially variant fill fraction if we wanted to do that. So I wanted to illustrate two things on this slide. One is, what does varying fill fraction look like? And then the other, what about spatially varying the geometry? What could that look like? So going back, we, we did the size of the triangles doing a, a spatially variant fill fraction, but I wanted to illustrate on a different type of unit cell to, to give greater clarity. So here, I'm showing what is probably a face-centered cubic unit cell, and it's the same unit cell. The only difference is the size of the spheres. So for really small spheres being cut out, this has a very high fill fraction. Very large spheres cut out, this has a very low fill fraction. So notice we are increasing fill fraction left to right. 
And so now imagine we could spatially vary this fill fraction across a lattice. Another thing which we haven't talked a whole lot about in this presentation, and I may include this as an extra at some point, but what if we wanted to spatially vary the geometry of the units or the pattern within it? So we still have a square unit cell all the way from left to right, but the pattern within it, within it goes from square to circle. And we see these, we can continuously vary from one to the other. But we could similarly kind of grade going from circle to triangle or some other shape. So we can do this. And in which case, to do this, we have spatially variant Fourier amplitudes. So when we FFT the unit cell, what we would do is we would FFT all of these, calculate all those Fourier coefficients, and spatially vary amongst that. So it's a more advanced concept. I'm not going to cover it in this lecture, but I, I, we probably will cover that at some point. So that's it. That concludes the spatially variant algorithm. The next thing I want to do is talk very briefly about differences between this transformation electromagnetics and really how I think this could be hybridized. So let's remember what transformation electromagnetics is. It's a coordinate transformation technique. Our spatially variant tool, not a coordinate transformation technique. There is no coordinate transformations. We literally draw pictures of how we want it to be spatially varied and it gets incorporated into the math and it happens. Transformation electromagnetics is based on Maxwell's equations. The spatially variant tool is not. It's just a geometry calculator. So the transformation EM comes out with a map of what the permeability and permittivity tensors would need to look like. And they could have crazy values or, or, or very anomalous values, be anisotropic, be quite crazy. But it doesn't tell you how to realize the mu and epsilon. That's a whole other step that has to happen. Whereas with the spatially variant tool, when it is done, we're ready to build. The, the geometry is finished. In transformation EM, what comes out of that are devices really just based on refraction. We're grading the, the permeability and permittivity, and that is refracting rays, or bending the fields. So the spatially variant tool, in fact, can exploit other phenomena. For example, self-collimation. If we spatially vary the orientation of unit cells, we can flow a wave arbitrarily through a lattice. Something like that, that I know of anyway, can't be designed with transformation EM because we could do it with an isotropic unit cell and we don't spatially vary the fill fraction. So as far as the permittivity and permeability go in a spatially variant self-collimating lattice, there's nothing interesting happening. So there's mechanisms that transformation EM just can't design or exploit where the spatially variant tool is. But I really view these not as competing tools, but two different sides of the same coin. So let's think about how they can be hybridized. So as input, we would draw this ray bending map. Maybe we do it as a coordinate transformation. We run transformation optics or transformation electromagnetics, and we come out with this crazy map of mu's and epsilons. Well, if we had a library of metamaterials that could realize those mu's and epsilons, we could then come up with maps of what the unit cells need to look like as a function of position. Well, this, that's exactly the input to the synthesis algorithm, and out would come our spatially variant metamaterial lattice that does not have defects, it's smooth, it's continuous, and looks really nice. So I envision these two algorithms as the opposite side of the same coin, and I think there's a lot of merit into hybridizing them. That's it for the theory. Now I want to show you some of the places that we are applying this. And the first one is spatially variant self-collimating photonic crystals. Our goal here is to come up with a block of, in this case, a photonic crystal. And if, if this were just an ordinary block or if it was a uniform photonic crystal, we would shine energy in from this bottom right side and it would just go straight through the lattice and be detected by a detector over here. Well, instead, we want to take this beam and flow it around a bend so that it comes out on this upper right side rather than the upper left. So what's 
How can we do that? Well, we've already discussed a bunch of different ways, but here we're going to talk about using self-collimation to do that. So first, if we had a uniform slab of photonic crystal, and looking at this slab, imagine this was repeated infinitely up and down. So we're looking at one unit cell up and down, and probably something like 20 by 20 unit cells within the plane. So if this self-collimated, it really would just self-collimate from left to right here and not do anything useful. But what we want to do is grab this lattice at either side and bend it to spatially vary the orientation of the unit cells now to flow a beam around a bend. So that's what it would look like. Now our algorithm definitely minimizes deformations to this lattice. However, they're still happening. A little bit. Definitely not as much. But notice the unit cells near the inside of the bend are a little bit compressed compared to the unit cells on the outside of the bend. So right away we can conclude that at least the center frequency of self-collimation will be shifted from the inside to the outside of the lattice. Hopefully the bandwidth of self-collimation is wide enough that it can still all work at the same frequency, but we've definitely shifted where they're self-collimating. So what can we do? Well, if the unit cells are compressed, they become smaller. We can make them electrically larger by increasing the fill fraction here. Likewise, at the outside of the lattice, these have been stretched. They've become physically larger. We can make them electrically smaller by lowering the fill fraction, less dielectric. So now, in addition to the spatially variant orientation, We've also built in a spatially variant fill fraction that actually retunes this lattice so it's all self-collimating at the same frequency. So the ability to spatially vary multiple things can be very important. So here's what a full lattice would look like. And in fact, we designed one of these and we built it and we tested it and it worked. And here's that device. So we have a miner's hat here for scale, so you can see how large this thing is. It was designed to work at 15 gigahertz. And here's a publication where we talk about all the details about how, it's, uh, how we designed it and more details of the measurements. But here are the measurements. So we can see a top view of the lattice. The, the blue background color is showing you the orientation that we used. And these red lines are our measured values on the, the center frequency of self-collimation. And we didn't actually include a spatially variant fill fraction here. I intentionally did not want to do that because I didn't want there to be any argument that it really is a spatially variant self collimation and not some kind of graded index effect due to the fill fraction. So we did not spatially vary the fill fraction. We still got very strong bending. If we put in the spatially variant fill fraction, things would probably get even better. One thing we didn't do in this lattice, we didn't do anything about reflections at the interfaces. So, not such a big deal at this first interface. The, the beam would hit the surface, some would scatter, but some would enter. And the stuff that scatters wouldn't disrupt our measurements on the other faces. It just goes left and disappears. But let's think about the beam that hits this interface. Well, we see some of it would certainly go back in this direction, but it also self-collimates in this direction, also self-collimates in this direction, and then those waves scatter. And that's what really has led to the noise in these other interfaces. It's the scattering within the lattice. Had we done something to minimize reflections here, I believe that data would look a lot better. I want to leave you with some final notes on a spatially variant self-collimating lattice. This is not a waveguiding effect. In a waveguide, the modes are forced to look like certain patterns. Well, in self-collimation, in principle anyway, if you illuminate it with a beam that looks like a smiley face in the cross-section, it comes out, in principle, looking like a smiley face. Whereas a waveguide, that's not true. Um, so I would say, in principle, that amplitude information is carried by this. But if we think about what self-collimation is, we're really just directing the power in a single direction. What's happening to phase, we're not yet controlling. And then the last note is a spatially variant self-collimating lattice, at least any way that I can think of, cannot be designed with transformation electromagnetics. In this case, our unit cell is isotropic, so there's no tensors. The fill fraction wasn't spatially varied, so the effect of VO and epsilon 
stays the same. So as far as the permeability and permittivity goes, this spatially variant subcollimating lattice is just a solid homogeneous brick of material. Nothing interesting, yet we see it turn a beam. And so this is a, a diffraction effect, it's a resonance effect, and transformation electromagnetics can't be used to do that. The last example of what we're doing with this is a concept called spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial. Here's our goal. Um, suppose we have a, a microstrip transmission line and we put a metal object in close proximity to that. That will disrupt a wave traveling down that microstrip transmission line. Well, what if we want to fix that? We've already shown in earlier lectures what we can do is embed this system in a spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial, and now the near field around that line we can sculpt like clay. So what we have is a metamaterial, and on the edges, these holes are pointing straight up and down. And so the, the direction with the highest dielectric constant is straight up and down. Now as we approach where we would drop this metal object, and you can barely see it, but there's a hole here that we would drop a metal object and get very close to the line that would disrupt the line. However, we're taking the orientation of these holes and tilting them to the side by 60 degrees, so now the holes are running down this, this diagonal. And what that does to the near field is pull it away from where that metal object would be. And so in concept anyway, now if we drop the metal object down this hole, the line wouldn't feel it because the near field has been shifted away due to the spatially variant anisotropy. So this is our design. We went ahead, we 3D printed a real device, we backfilled it with a high dielectric constant powder, I believe in this case it was titanium dioxide. So the holes now are filled, which did have air, now they're filled with this high K powder so we have these High, high dielectric constant rods, if you will, in this lower dielectric constant background. This is ABS plastic, dielectric constant somewhere around two and a half. And so here's our results. The first thing we did without any spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial, without any of that in place, uh, we have just a bare transmission line, so we see good transmission through this. Then we took a metal ball and we dropped it right next to the line, not touching it, but right up next to the line. And with our vector network analyzer, we can see the scattering parameters jump around. So this blue line is the change in the S11 parameter as we drop the ball and take it away, drop the ball, take it away, and we see that jump around. So the blue tells us, shows us the jumping. Then we put our spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial in place, and you can see this dark dot here. That's a hole through the SVAM, or spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial. That's where we drop the ball. But, in this case, it's pulling the near field away to the right, and so away from where the ball would be. So, of course, it's not going to feel the ball anymore. So when we do this and we measure the, the delta in the, the S11, we see virtually nothing. And that's because the field has been pulled away from where the ball is. And so what we're proposing to do is when we want to bring devices in close proximity, that we can infiltrate this space with an anisotropic metamaterial, spatially vary it, and isolate components in proximity. We think we can also let devices work in awkward form factors, let antennas radiate around and through other things, all by sculpting these near fields. So that's the end of this lecture.